Good morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome you back to Two in One Ministries, and I wanted to thank you so much for joining us today. Today, we are going to be discussing who God is. And many different religions of the world teach many different things. And so you're thinking, well, who's right, and how can I be saved, and, and how can I know for sure um, who or what I can have my foundation for my life in, my soul's trust in? What authority do I trust? Well, God tells us that we can always trust his holy word, the Bible, because he never sinned, and he wrote this book. He told 40 authors exactly what to pen down. And so to begin with, I would like to share a verse with you all from the book of Revelation, which is the last book in the Bible. And the verse is found in Revelation chapter 14, verse 6. And I want you to focus on these two words, everlasting gospel. The word everlasting means forever, and gospel means good news. And the good news is that Jesus came to love you and to give his life for you, to raise up from the dead, and if you're saved, to come back for you and catch you away someday soon. So here's the verse. Revelation 14, verse 6, it says, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth. This is later on in Bible prophetic history. And to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. So today we are going to focus on the Bible doctrine of who God is. And he is recorded with many, many proofs all throughout the Bible to be three distinct personalities in one. And please join us now with our teacher, Todd Frederick, and he's going to explain this concept to us. And we are gonna be traveling all over the Bible, so get your King James Bibles out right now, and uh, we're just gonna jump in to the study. Thanks again for joining us. Okay. Uh, good afternoon again. We are uh, going through these important studies uh, from week to week and we just got finished doing a series on the death of a nation so you can follow up on that. Um, this topic we're doing is to help eliminate some problems that we have in society, especially uh, we're having illiterate people spiritually because of the removal of God from the presence of public school and all like that due to uh, Justice Warren with the Supreme Court back in the early 60s. He and his uh, cohorts up in uh, the then U.S. Supreme Court. And then you had uh, President Johnson, who before was uh, a senator, a senator for Texas. The, the Johnson Amendment, and they passed it, which helped to eliminate pastors from being able to talk about how bad uh, politicians are, which ones, who they should vote for, and so forth. Um, so as a result of that, we've got about 60-plus years of um, give or take of people who've been wandering in a spiritual darkness and then you've had cults arising over the years uh, uh, Taz Russell and uh, Mary Eddie Mary Andy Baker um, and of course uh, Joseph Smith and all these others who have taken Christ and made him into something he's not even uh, the teachings of Islam teach that Christ is just a good prophet um, more than just a problem, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so, if you haven't already, uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel and or BitChute channel. We're on it as well. Um, our BitChute channel is WTSA, like uh, wider than spell appliances. And then just ring the bell, um, <coughs> subscribe, and that way you can get alerts of each uh, message we could put up later on, or video of some sort. Um, so, today we're talking about these matters of who God is, we'll bring a little clarity to who God is, to uh, uh, the Hindu, they just think, um, on a broad perspective, to the ignorant Hindu, they think that um, there are hundreds of millions of gods, 
but to the um, astute follower of Hinduism, uh, they believe that you become God. So they believe in one God, um, ultimately. And uh, but we're not God. We never will. But we do have a God that uh, we'll be discussing, and uh, He presents Himself in three persons. So we got the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, in uh, I think it's Islam, they teach. Uh, that God has like 90 different ni- names and 90 different titles and all like that, which uh, they think is a surprising thing that, you know, uh, that we should think that God is in three persons. But technically, he, uh, as in discussing with an imam in town, I asked him, I said, now, are you, a, uh, are you married? And he said, well, I'm fixing to get a divorce. But uh, I said, okay, well, you're still married. It's okay. So you're uh, got any children? He said, yeah, I've got a son. So I explained to him, well, you're one person, but you you admitted that you're a father, you're a husband, and of course you're a son of your father. So you're three roles, you have three personalities, three positions, so to speak, but you're one person. And I explained to him that that's how the way it is with God. He presents himself as the father in heaven, and then uh, Christ being his love give to us to save us and then you have the spirit of God who dwells in, in the believer and then is outside of the unbeliever and trying to draw him to believe in Christ so it's all in all uh, the work of God in those three persons and so we see the, um, the evidence of Old Testament teaching that there's the concept of the Trinity uh, you have in Genesis 1 1, where it speaks of, uh, you know, in this particular case, the names of God is Elohim, which denotes plurality. In the beginning, God created the heavens and earth. Um, pronoun, speaking of God, um, in 126 of Genesis, it says, um, Let us make man in our image. And so prior to um, grace of man, you think, okay, there's only been uh, five days of stuff being created prior to that. So you have, obviously God is speaking within himself, let us make man in our image. He's not going to be speaking to an angel, uh, though they were just created on day four. Uh, so he wouldn't have any need to discuss that with them because they have no power. Uh, and God says in another place, uh, who shall counsel me? Um, so he speaks within himself within this realm of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so uh, what we'll get into is showing the various uh, interchangeableness of names of God in these acts of creation. So uh, next thing we'll talk about is uh, the use of theophanies. That's where God came down to earth and, and talked with man and uh, walked with him. Uh, it says in one part in the book of one of the books of Moses, it says that um, no man has seen God at any time and live shall live. So he has to come down in a different form. He can't come down as his, his essence that he is he can, as his Jehovah uh, Elohim. So he comes down as what's called a theophany, where God appears as a man, um, or it's also referred to as the angel of the Lord. And uh, we find that in Genesis 16, 7, and 18, 1 through 2. And the angel of the Lord found her, that's talking about Hagar, by a fountain of water in the wilderness, by the fountain in the way to Shur. So again, talking about the angel of the Lord. And then in 18, 1 and 2. And the Lord appeared unto him, that's talking about Abraham, in the plains of Mamre, and he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. And he lifted up his eyes and looked, and lo, three men stood by him, and when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door, and bowed himself toward the ground, and said, My Lord, if now I have found favor in thy sight, Pass not away, I pray thee, from thy servant. Okay, yeah, in this case you got three uh, men that appear, but obviously that's not a type of the Trinity. This 
just that those three um, appearances there, uh, the one of which says in the Lord, and that's in all uppercase. Now it's interesting that um, you'll see in your Bible, if you pay attention, you'll see that it says Lord in all caps. That's going to refer to Jehovah Elohim, the self-existing one. You refer to him as uh, uh, God as the Heavenly Father. Um, and then if you remember how that in John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. So um, God, you'll see in a little bit, is uh, addressed by Abraham as capital L, little O-R-D, Lord. But when God speaks to Abraham, he is in all caps. So basically, uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. But, um, so this is the often here, God is referred to often as the angel of the Lord. Um, but he's actually, you, if you look at the language, it shows that the Lord appeared. And then it goes on. So there's the appearance of theophanies of God. Uh, then evidence of God working in Genesis 1, 2. But yet it's referring to the Holy Spirit. Now you got to remember that in, in the book of you know Genesis 1, 1, it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. So okay, you got God created heaven and the earth. But then you'll see other words, names used interchangeably. So you'll have, like here, Genesis 1, 2, it says, uh, And the earth was out without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the water. And, uh, or waters. So you have God present at creation, and in that same instance, His Spirit is. So it's being used interchangeably. Uh, the Father and was there at creation, and His Spirit was there at creation. Uh, it's not three gods, like some people say. It's one God, and three persons, and roles, and, pers and, uh, and uh, positions, and so forth. Each one doing the bidding that needs to be done. So I can explain to that Imam too. I was like, uh, okay, you're talking to me, but what is that that I'm hearing? And he said, you know, well, I don't know what to say, but I said, basically, when you're talking to me, I'm hearing your words, and basically, your thoughts are coming out in words, and it takes breath to bring out those words. Um, if you didn't speak them, then there would just be thoughts in your mind. Um, so the point is, you have the Father who was there at creation, and Jesus is the Word, the Bible says in the New Testament. So he spoke, God had his thoughts about what he's going to do and create. So Jesus is the Word, so God put forth his Word, and when he spoke it, then that is the Spirit, which we'll talk about in a minute, the, the wind, you think about new moss. You have to breathe in, breathe out. And that's what God did. God breathed. And that's how we get our Bible too. Holy men of old wrote as they were so moved by the Holy Ghost. So the scriptures God breathed. So these are all arguments that you need to use to explain things that's complex. But when you break it down like that, it's pretty simple. Um, so next you see uh, like New Testament evidences supporting the Trinity doctrine. Uh, Three persons of Godhead documented in the baptism of Jesus. Matthew 3, 16 through 17. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and like teen upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Okay, so there you see all three parts of the God had mentioned. You had the Spirit, and you had the Son, and the Father who spoke and said, This is my beloved Son, hear him, in whom I am well pleased. Um, so, um, here we see also in... 3 persons of the Godhead referred to and as singular. Um, that's in 
Matthew 28, 19. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Yeah, so see that verse, we learned from that that uh, if, if they were three gods, and some people think they would leave, then it was a baptizing them in the names of plural of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit. But by saying in the name of, then that shows singularity and is showing the teachings that the three are one. Name, not name. So then uh, you have uh, three benefits bestowed by the three persons of the Godhead as in 2 Corinthians 13, 14. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. Yeah, so I showed you that you have love, grace, and communion. And you take out one of those aspects and you're basically uh, taking out that role of God. And so that's why when people, you know, they mock Christianity or whatever, and they say, well, there's not a hell, or if there is a hell, I'll go down there and enjoy it with my friends. No, you can't, because we only have order in this life because we have you have the presence of God through the three persons of God here. And without God in the presence of any place, obviously he's not going to be in hell. So with the absence of God, there'll be no fellowship, no grace, and no love. And that's why hell is a place of torment. You won't, even if you were there with your mother, let's say if your mother died and went to hell and you followed suit back of her and, and your dad and grandma and everybody like that, you wouldn't even, you wouldn't even care for each other. Because absence of God is no love and no grace, no fellowship. Um, so then next you see the uh, Trinity is illustrated by Jesus praying to the Father. So you, this is one thing that the cults will use. They'll say, well, well Jesus praying to himself to be with God, you know. Uh, but we have to look at that this is a, a verse that shows clarity in the Trinity. It says that. Um, Jesus praying to the Father said, And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Yeah, so we're given a promise there uh, that Jesus, once he is resurrected from the dead, because death has no power over Christ, and uh, so he's raised from the dead, taken away from the earth, the disciples will be all distraught, and uh, you know, not having Christ there be their friend, the comforter, at, at that point. He said, I'll send you another comforter. And uh, that will be uh, referring to the Holy Ghost. And that was fulfilled in the book of Acts, uh, chapter 2. Uh, the next is uh, God's shown as the Father. And uh, we see that in Romans chapter 1, verse 7. It says to all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. Yeah, God the Father. Then you see uh, God shown as the Son. Uh, speaking of, about Christ, Acts 1 8. Or excuse me, Hebrews 1 8. Okay. It says. But unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Yeah, so if we, if we don't see and accept that Jesus is God, then we got a problem here because uh, God in, in the Ten Commandments said, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And of course, God is being the lawgiver. That was the only place ever noted that God himself wrote the scripture. Now this other was written by men who were told by God what to write, you know, the Old Testament, New Testament, and so forth. But the Ten Commandments was written by God himself, and he actually himself stated, don't have any other God before me. But then here, he's saying, the psalmist is writing down what God is telling him, um, thy throne, O God, he's saying, um, and he's speaking to the Son, so obviously the Son is God. And thy throne, he says, O oh God, is, shall be an everlasting throne and scepter. I don't have the passage. I just have a little portion of it. Uh, 
but it's God is the Son. So like I said, they're used interchangeably. And then uh, God is shown as the Holy Ghost in this uh, New Testament example. Acts 5, through, uh, 3 through 4. And Peter said, Ananias, why does Satan fill thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? While it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. Okay, so there you have a God being lied to. You break that down. Peter is giving him uh, this question. He says, uh, Why does Satan fill thy heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? Okay, you lie to the Holy Ghost. Now, some people say, you know, the Holy Ghost is just a power, like electricity or whatever, so how can you lie to electricity? He, this Ananias was lying to a person, the person, third person of the, the Godhead. Incidentally, we had a study on uh, the Holy Ghost, who the Holy Ghost, and like that, for like an entire year. So you're welcome to go look at those. They are from on July 2019 to, um, where's 2000? Anyway, it's like, uh, it's about a six month study, I can't remember. But anyway, you can go back and find them. It's very helpful. So, Ananias lied to the Holy Ghost, but then he says, um, the last part of verse 4, he says, You have not lied unto men. In other words, and then Ananias answered Peter, he says, Oh, yes, we sold this land to them. So he basically lied to Peter. But ultimately, when you lie to somebody, you lie to God. He says, Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. So he said, you lied unto the Holy Ghost. And he said, why do you lie unto God? Uh, he's not lying unto men, but unto God. So there again, you're having God and the Holy Spirit interchanged. Um, so you can't do that with a mere person. Peter couldn't say, you lied unto me, and therefore you lied unto God. Uh, that would equate him with God. But you can't say that about the Holy Ghost. So uh, the next... Um, we see God again being shown as the Father in these scriptures. Now this section here is going to tell about who God the Father is. Proofs of it. Uh, Genesis 2, 4 states uh, 2, 4. Yes, I was going to make a quick comment here before we read this verse. Um, I think that a lot of people um, don't know the difference between us and God and so even though um, when Christians go to heaven and God says that we will be like him, we will be like him in the sense that we will not sin anymore. But we will never be God in the sense that he is distinctly omniscient, which means all-knowing. He is distinctly omnipotent, which means all-powerful. And he is distinctly omnipresent. omnipresent, which means he is present everywhere at the same time. So that's what sets us apart um, from God for all eternity. And right now, we are very different than God, of course, because we are all born sinners since Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden. We inherited their sinful nature. I'm going to say this real fast, so and tying in with that, and speaking to that Imam, I was telling him about that God is those three things. Uh, he's omni, uh, omnipresent. So we, of course, we have an appliance business, and at the time I had a uh, washer in the back of my truck. We was talking out in the parking lot. So he said, uh, so... If God's everywhere, he says, is he in that washer? So he, he's there again trying to think with his logical mind. But see, uh, you, and I forgot about the verse in uh, Psalms where David talked about whether I uh, go into heaven, thou art there. Or if I ascend into into hell, thou art there. He's talking about the grave. He's talking about the, uh, the presence of God in hell. But he's talking about the hell and the grave. Uh, Lord, if I'm in hell, Thy presence is there. So that's a, um, evidence there for God being omnipresent. We think in the terms of our three-dimensional mind or whatever it would be, 
that you know, when we sit down, we're there. But God is everywhere. Uh, so, but in this verse here, speaking about who God the Father is and what He had done, it says, uh, "In the day that the Lord God, and that's speaking of Jehovah Elohim, um, is very God Himself, uh, very essence, self-existing one, uh, because it's in all caps, Lord is and God, capital G, little Lord uh, In the day that the Lord God made the heaven." I made the earth and the heavens. So there again, in the beginning, it said God created the heavens and the earth. Uh, uh, capital G, little O R D, if I'm correct. Yeah, so I in uh, chapter 1, verse 1. So here, it expounds a little bit. And it says, okay, God the Father. And this is, uh, there again, like I said, uh, is denoting Jehovah Elohim, the self existing one. And then next is Genesis 4, 1, uh, where we just mentioned a while ago the uh, uh, reference of, of uh, a woman giving birth. It's not the same one, right? I have it. And Adam, yeah. knew his, and Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. Okay, so there again, that's Lord in all caps, and it denotes... Uh, the Father, Jehovah Elohim. Um, so, uh, and it's a self existing one. The first one was self existing great one, I mentioned, and this was a self existing one. And then uh, Genesis 6 5 speaks about that the Lord, uh, it just says, and God in all caps, God in all caps, saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. So, God here in all caps is referring to uh, Jehovah. And there again, the self-existing one. No one made God. He has always been and always will be. And that's something that uh, even as a child, if you think back and somebody's saying about God, say, okay, well, hey, you know, we see creation, how it was made, and this and that, and you go back, well, God made it, and who made God? The self-existing one. Um, and so Matthew eleven twenty five, Jesus refers to um, Jesus says this in his prayer. He says, "I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth." And so we just don't see it as saying like Lord or God or something like that, and in that sense. But he just directly Jesus refers to Jehovah Elohim as the Father, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth. And then in Romans 15, 6, um, it speaks of, you got that one. It says that ye may with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so another verse emphasizing the role and person and uh, so forth of the Father. And then Jude 1 um, skip one. First Peter one. First, first Peter one two speaks about in the foreknowledge of God the Father. Yeah. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Yeah, it's also uh, not only emphasizing just the uh, person of God the Father, but you got all. All three parts there of the Trinity. Yeah, God the Father, sanctification of the Spirit, and the Spirit, uh, um, and um, the obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Yeah. So you got uh, three for one there. Uh, so then over in Matthew eleven twenty five. No, wait, we just did that. Uh, Jude one. I don't have a chapter, uh, a verse rather. That's right. There is only one Chris. One chapter uh, threw me out there. I think. So it's chapter one, uh, verse one. Jude. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. Yeah. So we. That's another verse there showing uh, God the Father. And uh, so these are all verses. Um, you only really need to be told something once. 
uh, it's not always going to be uh, another opportunity. But here we're given verse after verse, specifically telling us who God is and what He's done in these particular circumstances. Um, so, in this case, uh, God the Father sanctifies believers. Sanctified has like two terms. What is like sanctified is set apart something. Like you might have fine china. You don't want to get it out for your kids having a sleepover and a pizza party. Um, now you set that aside for good company who are mature right? and not consider you know, great. Um, so on the one hand, that's set apart. That's what we are. We set apart from the world and set un apart unto the service of God. But also uh, sanctify means to um, to cleanse, to make holy. But in in the case where we're talking about Christ being made um, sanctified, you know, he, he sanctified himself. That doesn't mean that he was unclean and became clean. It just remember, means that he was set apart for uh, service um, to the redemption of us, you know, uh, going through the cross and so forth. So that's what sanctification there is, but God the Father does that. <clears throat> and uh, so um, God, this section here will talk about the uh, God is being presented by, or represented by Jesus. Um, the scriptures there show in John 1, 1 and 14. Okay, now this verse shows us that Jesus is the Word, and Jesus is also God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then in verse 14, it tells us about when the Holy Spirit um, brought Jesus to earth in the form of a little seed and implanted um, the seed into the womb of Mary, um, the earthly mother of Jesus. And keep in mind that Jesus here, um, and uh, when he came to earth, was 100% God still, and as well as 100% man. And yeah, like, the word was made, I'm sorry. Yeah, and some people get that confused, like some people go so far as to, you know, they're again you know, thinking with their natural mind and saying, oh, well, so the Holy Ghost came and had sex with Mary. That's the most blasphemous thought, because it said that the Holy Ghost overshadowed Mary, and that thing which was formed in her was uh, created by the, was formed by the Holy Ghost. So basically it was like an artificial insemination, I guess you could say. Uh, where the sperm, I mean, God created the heavens and the earth and everything like that, but Christ wasn't created. But that part that was necessary of the male uh, interaction for uh, with an egg was taking place right there. And uh, there didn't have to be any contact. I mean, I guess you could say it was a contactless um, reproduction there. It's like an artificial insemination. But the same people would say that, you know, what God, did he have a, sex with Mary. No, he didn't. Uh, no more than it be uh, making about as much sense as uh, God had sex with the earth and, and uh, then came forth Adam. You know, so we need to stop thinking with our natural minds and, and uh, listening to Satan. Of course, he wants to twist our minds and scriptures and stuff like that. But it's taken as it says, uh, he overshadowed Mary and that thing which was forming her was uh, of God. Okay, so, um, and then here in verse 14, so it explains this miracle. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Yeah, so here we see that, now, the cults, what they want to do, like the uh, uh, Russellites, people who follow Ash Russell, uh, they call themselves Jehovah's Witnesses, which is probably the truth. Uh, with their Watchtower um, production of the uh, New New World Translation, they'll take that verse and they'll add in a word. They'll take a word out and add in a word. They'll say, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was a God. I can not say that, capitalized or whatever. But, um, but it doesn't say that. They add in the word a, and that, that a is just enough to damn somebody. Because... Jesus was a God. He was the God. And I mean, that's and that word. It's implied. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And you go on down to verse 14, as you read. And the Word 
was made flesh and dwelt among us. So you take out, you can use interchangeably because of verse 1 and chapter 1 of John, uh, and the Word became flesh, and be, uh, I mean, uh, uh, in the beginning was the Word, and the, and the Word, word was, was God. God, and the Word was God. So you can interchange that, the Word is God, God is the Word. So you take that interchangeably there on verse 14, it says, and the Word was made flesh, you can put in God, and, and it wouldn't be doing injustice to the scripture. So you could say, and, the, and God was made flesh and dwelt among us. And that's what happened, as we talked about in the uh, in, uh, in act of the conception, where Christ was born uh, of a woman, uh, not of Adam's seed, uh, because then that would be the tainted bloodline. Um, immediately after Adam's sin, they had to leave out the Garden of Eden. And then their first, uh, I guess maybe their maybe the second born, so I'm not sure which order it was. Um, you had Cain and Abel. Maybe Cain was first. Anyway, uh, so as a result of that bloodline being painted by Adam, his son Abel was killed by his brother Cain. So from there on, so Christ couldn't have been born of uh, this tainted bloodline. That's why he had to be born. Okay, at this point we'll uh, have to touch they can uh, splice the video. Basically, uh, we made it too long for an upload, so we're cutting the video in half, and uh, want you to come back and see part two, which will follow up um, after this one, of course. Uh, so thanks for watching. Um, leave us a comment, a like. Let us know if this has been a, a pretty good explanation and clarifying some things that you may have had doubts about to the Trinity. Uh, again, thanks. This is Todd and Heather, 2-in-1 Ministries, and be sure to watch part 2.